Uh, thank you for having me. I appreciate uh, being with you. I wish I could be with you in person. Uh, that's not possible, uh, but I did have a very nice visit to Rieti early last year and uh, hope to make it back sometime soon. So we'll make do with a virtual presentation. This is, uh, as the title says, a political scientist look at the 2020 presidential election. Uh, that means it will be a more technical presentation than you would get from a journalist or a pollster, but you are a smart <laughs> and uh, energetic audience. So I'm, I am sure that your level of engagement will be just right for the talk. Um, it is October 6th here and things are moving very quickly in terms of the news in the campaign. So this is my look at the election as of today, but things are, uh, are changing by the hour, it seems in the US presidential election. So let me start by outlining some factors that as a political scientist, I would think about being important in the 2020 election. And I will divide these factors into two types. One are factors that political scientists and historians and economists believe are well understood regularities. These are predictable relationships between underlying conditions or historical patterns and election outcomes. But then there are some new items in the atmosphere this year that I would categorize as uncertain in their impact. And so I'll, I'll try to talk through both the well understood elements and the uncertain elements. What is well understood are historical patterns that relate things like economic performance and incumbency to election outcomes. Those we can apply to 2020 without much difficulty. The other well understood element is the way that Donald Trump won his election four years ago in somewhat unusual circumstances that put him in a precarious position in 2020. So those are easier to digest and I'll spend the first part of my talk on those. Then there are a second category of things that are more difficult to get our hands around. Uh, one is the degree to which voters blame Donald Trump for the spread of the pandemic and the outbreak of the virus in the United States, or to what degree they view him as managing it well. That's an unknown, obviously very new factor. Uh, second is the very unusual economic situation in the United States with the economy contracting and millions of jobs lost. That's obviously connected to the pandemic and voters' views of the economy typically re re relate very strongly to election outcomes. But because this economic downturn is related to a pandemic for which Trump may not be seen as fully responsible, that does complicate it. And then finally, there have been for the last few years, uh, protests about the treatment of black Americans. And this year in particular treatment by the police of black Americans, those protests have broken out in cities all around the country and Trump's handling of them is one of the things that voters are thinking about as we go into this final stretch of the election campaign. So the, these will be more difficult for me to assess, uh, but we'll think about what role they play. So let's start with some historical patterns. A really important pattern is what happens when an incumbent runs for reelection. That has happened in American history 32 times. You see all of the cases listed here. On the left are the 22 times when the incumbent won reelection. On the right are the 10 times when the incumbent lost. So it's, it's apparent that incumbents tend to win 22 out of 32, that's about a 70% success rate. So it, it is somewhat unusual for an incumbent to not succeed in running for a second term. And for the past 50 years, US presidents have been limited to just two terms. So it's the only opportunity for reelection. The last time this happened was in 1992 when George H.W. Bush lost election in the midst of an economic recession. Before that was Jimmy Carter in 1980. That also was very difficult economic times. Before that was 1976, which was an unusual election because Gerald Ford had not won the election on his own. He had taken office after President Nixon resigned. So those are the three most recent cases, but they are about a generation ago. And before that, you have to go back to the Great Depression in 1932 to find a case of where a president lost. So these are really the exceptions to the rule and not knowing anything else about our current president or the situation, we would think that the president would get the benefit of the doubt and would be about twice as likely to win as to lose. So that's one important condition that is supporting Donald Trump's reelection, this kind of benefit of the doubt factor. 
that most presidents seem to have. Uh, but of course, there are other factors pushing in different directions. And that, uh, I think one related factor here is how long the party in power has been in office when re-election is sought. So here I have a listing of elections from 1960 onward, so a, a, about the last 60 years or so, that shows what happens after a, a president's party has been in office for just one term. Those are all the elections on the left. 2020 is one of those elections because Donald Trump has only been in office since 2017. You can see that in nearly all of those elections, the incumbent won a second term, 1980 being the one exception. So that's a rate of six wins to one loss, six out of seven. The pattern would suggest that Donald Trump is in a good position to win. And that's a very different situation than when a party has been in office for two terms or longer. Those are the cases on the right. 2016 was the last example of this where the Democrats had been in the White House for two terms under Obama and Hillary Clinton was hoping to extend that to a third term for the Democrats. In nearly all of these cases, the party lost. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven losses out of eight total elections. So there really is a, an important difference between parties who are hoping to continue for a second term and those that already have two terms and are hoping for more. Uh, and so this is another reason why we might expect Trump to come into the election with an advantage. There are just many advantages of being an incumbent seeking reelection. But that is balanced against the way that Trump came to office four years ago. This is the map you may have seen elsewhere of the electoral college results in the 2016 election. As you probably know, the popular vote in the United States does not determine who wins the election. Hillary Clinton actually won more popular votes by about 3 million votes, but Donald Trump managed to flip six states that had gone for the Democratic candidate Barack Obama in 2012, but in some cases narrowly moved into Trump's uh, favor in 2016. The three most important of these that really everyone is watching are the states in the Midwest, Wisconsin, where I live, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. Those three states were all won by Trump by less than one percentage point. It all told those three states together, uh, in those three states together, Donald Trump won by about 80,000 votes. So in a country with uh, something like 130 million votes cast for president, it was 80,000 votes in three states that led to Donald Trump's election. This puts him in a very difficult position as a, an incumbent running for re-election because he did not win the popular vote and his electoral college victory was dependent on these very narrow victories in three states in particular uh, and really no gains elsewhere in the country. Uh, you'll see there, there are three other states that flipped as well, Iowa, Ohio, and Florida. Those are also swing states and they're very much in jeopardy for Trump this year. So he begins without a, a, an overwhelming victory that he could build on in 2020. And his campaign, if it's successful, is most likely going to replicate this map. He would need to win all of the states he won last time effectively to be president again. Uh, that's a difficult task given the, the situation in which Trump finds himself. So the nature of his victory does temper, I think, the historical pattern of supporting incumbent presidents who run for re-election. Because he lost the popular vote and won in such a surprising fashion, he did not begin his first uh, days in office with high approval ratings. Here you'll see his approval ratings from January of 2017 until uh, I think it was yesterday. This was updated. This is from the website 538. These are all of the national surveys asking people if they approve or disapprove of the job that President Trump is doing as president. He really had no honeymoon or no positive mandate coming out of the election. Uh, the public was immediately negative about his performance and remarkably stable over these past four years. If you think about all of the things that have happened in American politics over the last four years, including government shutdowns, an impeachment of the president and trial of the president and the Senate, uh, scandals, other difficulties, and now the pandemic and, and protests about race and policing. It is surprising that his approval ratings hardly moved during this period of time. We would say in the US that he has a, high, a low ceiling. There's not very high he can go because of the nature of his win, losing the popular vote, but a high floor. There's a sort of minimum 
where his supporters are willing to hold him up. So his approval ratings rarely drop below 40% and, and really have not budged above about 43 or 44%. You'll notice there is a little movement in the last four or five months. When the pandemic began in the US in late March and early April, you'll see there's a slight uptick in his approval rating uh, around here. Just around the 1st of March, there was a sort of rally around the president effect. Uh, but as the reality of the pandemic hit and other issues began to creep in, his approval rating fell through the summer. And I, I think some of this is also tied to the protest over the death of George Floyd in the hands of police in Minnesota. Uh, but in the last couple of months, his approval rating has recovered a little bit. I think some of that is likely to be a campaign effect where Republicans are rallying around their candidate. But nonetheless, he remains in a difficult position and this narrow band is really important because as you're going to see in a moment, even a change of one or two or three percentage points can change the election. Trump is in an important range of public opinion where small differences can mean the difference between winning and losing. And so I'll show you that now. This is a scatter plot that shows the relationship between uh, presidential approval in the summer before the election, in this case, it's in June, and the share of the vote won by the incumbent party, in this case, it would be Trump's party in the presidential election. Again, remembering that the popular vote is not what decides presidential elections, but it's a pretty good guide to uh, how elections come out. These are all elections going back to World War II. And you'll see that there's a strong relationship between the two when the incumbent president is uh, benefiting from higher approval ratings up in this range, 50 or 60%, this party tends to win by large amounts. And when a party is, has an unpopular president, they tend to do poorly. That's not surprising. The correlation between these two variables is about 0.8. And it's actually stronger if you look only at the solid blue points, which show elections where there is an incumbent on the ballot. Right? So setting aside those where there's an open seat and no incumbent running for reelection, the relationship is even stronger. Now think back to the figure I just showed you where Trump's approval rating was about 43 or 44%. Find that on the figure at the bottom and you'll see that it lines up with a vote share of right around 50%. This is the tipping point where a president can be just popular enough to win the election or just unpopular enough to lose it. It seems very unlikely that Trump will win the popular vote in 2020 but it's possible that his approval rating will be just high enough and other factors will come together in a way that will give him a chance at winning the electoral college in the way he did four years ago. But you can see this is very tenuous territory and it's not where many presidents are when they seek reelection. This is what's unusual about Trump's reelection and why he, he may uh, counter the historic patterns of incumbents doing well because he has been at low approval ratings uh, from the beginning of his presidency and, and it puts him in some jeopardy according to this relationship. So overall, his approval rating is low uh, in the low 40s, but how does he fare when the public is asked about his handling of other parts of the presidency? Well, here's an example from a recent national survey conducted a couple of weeks ago that asked the public what they think of his overall approval rating. That's the, the middle answer. You'll see about 41% said they approved, that's very similar to the figure we just saw. Uh, but he they were also asked about his handling of the economy, his handling of appointments to the Supreme Court because he's just made a nomination for an open seat there, his handling of the coronavirus pandemic and his handling of the Black Lives Matter protests. Of these five indicators, the one on which Trump performs best is his handling of the economy. It's consistently an area where the public sees him doing better than his overall approval rating. On all of the other measures, handling of the Supreme Court, handling of the pandemic and the protest, more people disapprove than approve. And in some cases that is by a big margin. So one path to Trump winning reelection is to focus attention on where he has strength and he has strength when it comes to the economy. And traditionally the economy has been a very strong predictor of election outcomes. So it makes sense that this would be a way for Trump to become competitive again with Joe Biden, uh, given that he's trailing in most of the polls that we'll be seeing in a moment. So what is the relationship between the economy and presidential election outcomes? And is Trump 
in the territory now that would make us think that he has an opportunity to win. Well, let me show you another scatter plot of the same set of elections from World War II until uh, 2016. The vertical axis is the same thing we saw a moment ago. This is the share of the vote won by the incumbent party. But now along the horizontal axis is a measure of economic performance. And this is one that's been shown to be pretty strongly related to election outcomes. It's the change in GDP from the first quarter of the election year to the third quarter. So it's the quarter that's happening just as the election is about to take place. When that is positive, when there's growth, as you can see of one or two or even three percentage points, presidents tend to win re-election or their party wins re-election, even if it's not an incumbent on the ballot. And when growth is not as strong, when it's flat at around zero, where it was in 2008, 1960, or in the unusual cases where it's negative, as in 1980, presidents tend to pay the price and not be reelected. Now, where does President Trump stand on this measure? We don't know yet because the third quarter has not happened and we won't have those data for a while from the federal government. But forecasts from financial firms and think tanks are suggesting that the change in growth from the first quarter to the third quarter could be anywhere from negative one and a half points to maybe negative four or negative five points. Those are the best forecasts at the moment. That puts Trump in territory that doesn't even appear on this figure far off to the left uh, in a place that would make it very difficult for him to win re-election. The worst case you see here is 1980. That was Jimmy Carter's re-election attempt. He was badly beaten in the popular vote and in the electoral college. So Trump has to hope that voters don't punish him for terrible growth in GDP because they view it as a side effect of the pandemic and he is not entirely responsible for the pandemic. Uh, my, my elections research center and other centers have asked the public who they think is to blame for the pandemic. And uh, many Republicans at least and some independent voters don't blame Donald Trump. They blame either China or the federal government or public health officials or state governors or others. So it's possible that Trump could wiggle his way out of this if he is able to divert responsibility or blame to someone else. Uh, but if this basic relationship holds, uh, Trump is in a very difficult position, at least to win the popular vote, and would be in a very, still a difficult position to win in the electoral college. So these are historical patterns that are well understood. Uh, the value for Trump in terms of the economy is quite unusual. And so maybe it's outside the range where we feel comfortable extrapolating. Uh, but these are regularities that I would expect to hold up in 2020. Now, what do the polls have to say? Uh, there's been nationwide polling of the public asking them whether they are likely to vote for Donald Trump or Joe Biden for more than a year. And the polls shown here, this is a summary from the website Real Clear Politics, shows that Biden has been consistently ahead by somewhere between four to five percentage points to as high as nine or 10 percentage points. Today, it stands at a gap of about nine points. That is a very large gap, especially for an incumbent president. If that holds up through election day, this would be the worst popular vote defeat for an incumbent in a long time, since at least 1980 and, and maybe going back further. Uh, so this is unusual for an incumbent to be in this position. In addition, the polls show that this gap between Biden and Trump has existed for more than a year. Biden was leading Trump in polls before Biden was the nominee, before we knew who the Democrats would nominate. He was leading in the polls before the pandemic hit in March. He was leading in the polls before the protest over policing happened beginning in May and through the summer. Those things in fact have made the situation worse and you can see that the lines begin to separate in June and July as all of those factors sort of come together. So the, the polls alone indicate that Trump is in a difficult position. Now you might ask, weren't the polls also showing that Hillary Clinton was in a strong position against Trump four years ago? Maybe the polls are wrong again. They were wrong, especially in some key states like mine in 2016, might they be wrong again? Well, I think the situation is now different. So here's the figure I just showed you the trends in polling for the last year in 2020. Let me show you the same picture for 2016. 
same website, same sources, same methods. These are now the trend lines for Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. It's a different pattern. First of all, it's more volatile. There's a lot of movement up and down. And there are times, in fact, when Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton are effectively tied or uh, Trump is actually ahead. There's a, a brief blip in late summer where Trump is ahead. That's after the time of the Republican National Convention. And so it's not as clear that Clinton was in the lead. And at the end of this time period, as election hit, she only had a lead of three points, which is almost exactly where she finished in the national vote, as you saw a, a few slides back. In contrast, in 2020, Joe Biden is ahead by eight or nine percentage points, and it may be growing in the last day or so uh, since Trump's diagnosis with COVID and since the first presidential debate. So the greater stability and the greater gap between the candidates in 2020 makes me more confident that Trump is in real trouble. In addition, because Trump is the incumbent, he is well known and the election is largely a referendum on his performance. The public has very strong views about him. There are not many voters who are undecided. In contrast, four years ago, there were many more undecided voters and there were some significant third party candidates that also won some votes that added some complexity and uncertainty to the election. So the situation looks different now. And I think the polling is more likely to be an accurate picture of what happens on election day. So again, very difficult situation for Trump if he hopes to win the, at least the popular vote. It also presents real challenges for winning the electoral college vote because this, the pattern in swing states like Wisconsin and Michigan and Ohio also shows that Trump is behind. So the state polls and the national polls are telling a similar story. Now let's say a few words about the Electoral College because this is where the election will be decided. This is one of my favorite graphics portraying how to think about the 50 states. This is from the Cook Political Report. And this graphic arrays the states like a snake from the most democratic states on the left, places like California and Massachusetts, to the most Republican states on the right, states like Oklahoma and Nebraska. And in the middle are the states that may put Trump or Biden over the top in being the tipping point state. As you may know, there are 538 electors to be elected president. A candidate needs to win 270 of those electors by winning a series of states. Uh, my state, Wisconsin, looks like it's likely to be near the tipping point. There are 10 electoral votes in Wisconsin, but you can also see nearby are states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, Arizona, and Florida. All of these states are getting the attention from the candidates because these are the places that are likely to decide who wins the election. Uh, Trump is in now a difficult position in all of these states. He is trailing in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Minnesota, Arizona, in most of the Florida polls and in some of the North Carolina and Georgia polls. So at the moment, it looks as though Biden has more than the number of electoral college votes he needs, but of course that's uncertain and there's still a month uh, to go in the election. The other factor to keep in mind is that there is not a one-to-one -one relationship between the popular vote and the electoral college vote. The electoral college is currently structured in a way that, that is disadvantageous to Democrats. States in the electoral college get the number of electors equal to the number of senators and representatives they have. And that means that small, less, less populous states are overrepresented in the electoral college and more populous states get less representation than they would based on population alone. That means that the Democrats need to win the popular vote by more than just a majority if they wish to win the electoral college. We saw this in 2016 where the Democrats won the popular vote by about two or three percentage points, three million votes, and yet lost the electoral college vote by a notable margin. What I'm showing you here is a graphic from The Economist magazine, which ran a number of simulations this summer uh, using a statistical model to predict in hypothetical elections, what would happen in the electoral college for different uh, values of the popular vote. So in this graphic along the bottom is the share of the vote won by the democratic candidate. 50% would be a tie between Biden and Trump. Along the left, you see the number of electoral votes that the candidate is likely, that the democratic candidate is likely to win. 270 is the magic number for winning a majority. And these dots, each one of them shows one simulated election. So there are 2000 elections here in this scatter plot. 
you'll notice that right at 50-50, where the candidates are tied in the popular vote, most of those simulations are below the 270 line, meaning that Republicans would win the Electoral College in nearly every election where there's a tied popular vote. So that getting to 50% is not enough for the Democrats. They need to win by more. It's not until we get to about 52 or 53% that it becomes a competitive election in the Electoral College. And it's not until we get to about 54% that the Democrats in these simulations are winning the Electoral College on a consistent basis. So in the polling I showed you a moment ago, Joe Biden was ahead of Donald Trump by seven or eight or nine percentage points. He probably needs to be ahead by such a large margin to be confident about the Electoral College. When it, being ahead by only two or three points as Hillary Clinton was is not enough. Uh, and so I, I think the way to think about his advantage is not relative to a 50-50 race, but to a race that is 53 to 47 or 54 to 46. He is just a few percentage points ahead of that. So there is, there is still a challenge here for the Democrats in terms of pulling off the Electoral College vote. Um, so some, something to watch on election night. Let me highlight a couple other things happening this election that are of interest and add some uncertainty to, to the mix. One question is what voter turnout will be. Uh, in the midst of the pandemic, Voters are inhibited in their ability to vote. Many Americans have decided to vote by mail this year. That was something that was only used by about a quarter of voters four years ago. We may see a majority of voters voting by mail this year. Voting is already taking place in the United States uh, by mail. So there are about 4 million votes that have been cast nationwide already. Uh, what we don't know is whether this will lead to higher or lower turnout in the presidential election higher turnout generally advantages the Democrats this year in surveys that limit the analysis to the most likely voters. Uh, I'm sorry, the, the analysis that limits the analysis to most likely voters actually tends to help the Republicans a little bit, whereas a broader electorate with higher turnout tends to help the Democrats. One clue is to think about the turnout that happens in the midterm elections between presidential elections. The last one of these was in 2018, two years ago. You can see that the turnout rate in that election, which is the purple line, was about 50%. These are elections for Congress and for state governors and other state offices. That was actually the highest turnout in a midterm election in a century since 1912. And in, back in 1912, women did not have the right to vote in the United States and US senators were not even directly elected. So that's a very different environment. So the 2018 midterm elections suggest a lot of energy and a lot of engagement by voters. A lot of that is brought on in the Trump era. There's just a strong response to him. So we don't know what turnout will be in 2020 in the presidential election. Some predictions are that we may see 150 million people vote. That would be a turnout rate of about 62 or 63 percent. So it would be near a record high for the last century or so. That would presumably help Joe Biden further. Uh, but that's one of the things we don't yet know. The early vote by mail is very strong. We're seeing many more people vote by mail at this point in the election in early October than we have seen before. But that's no promise as to how many people will actually vote on election day and what the total of all of that activity will be. So this is another factor we don't yet know, but which does have something to do with the mix of votes between Biden and Trump. I should also point out that the presidency is not the only office on the ballot this year. The entire House of Representatives is up. They, they have terms that are just two years long and one third of the Senate is up or a little more than one third, those terms are staggered. Democrats currently have a majority in the House by about 40 seats. That means that Republicans would need to gain or flip about 20 seats in their direction. Uh, I think that seems very unlikely in this election environment. Republicans are not likely to make such big gains when the candidate at the top of the ticket, the president, is unlikely to win the popular vote, even if he manages an electoral college win. It seems unlikely that his victory would be so strong that he would have coattails that advantage Republicans down the ticket. In addition, the makeup of congressional districts in the House is, makes those elections quite predictable. In any given district, we have a pretty good idea of whether a Republican or Democrat is likely to win and those just are not likely to deviate enough for Republicans to get back in charge of the House of Representatives today. So I think Democrats are in a pretty safe position to continue their majority there. 
and Nancy Pelosi, at least for the time being, would remain as the Speaker of the House. The Senate, on the other hand, is a different story. The margin there is much narrower of the 100 seats. Republicans control 53. Democrats control 45. Plus, there are two independent candidates, uh, two independent senators, Bernie Sanders and Angus King, who caucus with the Democrats. So that effectively makes them 47. So 53-47, Democrats only need to pick up three seats in the Senate in order to get to a majority. If Joe Biden were to win the White House, his vice president, Kamala Harris, would become the president of the Senate. That is her role as vice president. She would be a tiebreaker. Uh, and so that would effectively give the Democrats majority control 51 to 50, if that were to happen. So what are the odds that the Democrats might actually gain the Senate and potentially have full control of the presidency in both chambers of Congress? Well, I think the prospects are quite good for Democrats. Many of the seats that are up this year are held by Republican senators. You'll see the map of the US with each state colored by the party of the senator who is up this year. There are 12 Democratic senators running for reelection and there are 23 Republicans. So there are many more Republican seats that have to be defended and that puts them more at risk. In addition, the 12 Democrats are in states that are pretty reliably blue. They are very Democratic states. States like Minnesota and Virginia and Illinois and Massachusetts, those Democrats are not in trouble. They are not facing strong opponents. There's only one state where the Democrat is likely to lose and that's in Alabama where the incumbent Democrat, uh, Doug Jones, won in a special election there. That's a very red state. And so Democrats may lose that one. That would take them down from 47 to 46. But there are many other states where the Republican incumbent is in trouble. In Arizona, the incumbent Senator Martha McSally seems likely to lose. Uh, in Iowa, the incumbent Senator Joni Ernst is in trouble and may lose. In the state of Maine, Senator Susan Collins is in very deep trouble and seems unlikely to win. Uh, in North Carolina, Senator Tom Tillis is also in a difficult position. In Georgia, there are actually two elections happening simultaneously because of a vacancy. Democrats could win one or maybe two of those. So in Colorado is another example where Senator Cory Gardner uh, is very likely to lose. That's becoming a very blue state and he has a strong opponent who used to be the governor of Colorado in John Hickenlooper. So there are plausibly five or six or seven states where the Republican senator could lose to the Democrat. That would easily give Democrats the majority in the Senate, even if they lose the Alabama seat that Doug Jones holds. So I think at the moment, the most likely outcome is that Joe Biden wins the popular vote by a significant margin, has a good chance at winning the Electoral College and becoming president. Democrats hold the House of Representatives without a lot of change in the margin of seats. And in the Senate, the Democrats have an opportunity to win a majority. Now, a majority may not be enough for them to effectively govern because there is a filibuster rule in the Senate that typically requires a supermajority of 60 votes to do most legislating. But it would allow a Democratic Senate to do things like nominate and approve justices to the Supreme Court and to other courts, as Republicans have done over the last few years with Trump. So the Senate races are interesting as well, and many of them are happening in key swing states where we will not know the election results immediately on election night. So there may be some waiting that has to take place. Uh, we may talk about that in the Q&A somewhat, but that's, that's another factor that's new this year. Okay, so that is my presentation about the 2020 election. Uh, as the, we mentioned in the introduction, I am the director of the Elections Research Center here at the university. If you are interested in keeping up with the research we do on elections in the US and some other countries, you might be interested in visiting our, our website, which is elections.lisc.edu, or following the center on either Twitter or Facebook.